Welcome to the We As Nature podcast, where inspiring visionaries share their personal stories of living in alignment with the more than human world, and how this informs their unique contribution to cultivating a flourishing future for life on Earth. Each month, We As Nature features a new storyteller, sharing their experience of how listening to and learning from diverse forms of life has altered their course. The power of story lies within each of us, offering a portal to the language of the heart, connecting us to our feelings as a source of inspiration and courage from which we can act. For those of us seeking to create a flourishing world, starting right where we are, these We As Nature stories offer a space to listen, contemplate, and envision new possibilities. We As Nature is brought to you by Flourishing Diversity, and you can find out more about who we are and what we do at the end of the episode, as well as in the show notes. Today, we welcome eco-artist and urban food-growing pioneer, Ian Solomon Carwell, a.k.a. KMT. Ian has channeled his relentless passion for the environment and conservation into positive social change and awareness raising for a multitude of social issues. His methods are diverse and include the power of song, spoken word, the rhythms of hip hop, dance and permaculture. He chose his artist name KMT with reverence to his ancestral homeland of Kemet, now known as Egypt, to indicate the progressive nature of his indigenous ancestors. KMT's pioneering work combines a love for music and nature, grounded in a deep respect for Mother Earth's beauty and abundance, with a focus on addressing issues of global food security and local food growing systems, all whilst entertaining and educating with infectious enthusiasm. This unique combination has weaved together to form the South London community-led food growing space, May Project Gardens, designed and guided by permaculture principles. Here, Ian and his team run an array of community events and programmes, including a six-month youth leadership programme called Hip Hop Gardens, which nurtures ideas and fuels passions through music and connection to the environment. Infused with wisdom and grit, Ian's story offers an inspiring example of the rays of light that can spawn from the pain of a challenging childhood, from the grief of losing a loved one, and the complexities of living with dyslexia, all of which he has channeled into compassion, hope, and creativity. Ian's story will begin shortly, starting with one of his songs entitled Little Seeds. As we move towards a space of listening, We'll leave a 10 second pause. Wherever you are, take a moment to slow down your thinking as you observe the space around you. Notice what you see and what you hear. Feel your breath as it comes and goes in an interchange with the environment around you. Fly little seeds every day, watching the world just change. Plant little seeds every day, watching the world just change. 2005, my mum, Sonia May, passed to the other side. After a lifetime battle with alcohol, diabetes, depression and doctor-induced drugs, The May Project Gardens is created to celebrate her life. My world, once dark, is now filled with light and inspires others to never give up the fight. 2006, Randy, head gardener, co-founder, plants his feet. He is the heart and soul that inspires the whole May team. Two years later, the once debris garden now grows. Potatoes, 
grapes. I'm starting to like marrows. Created using permaculture that looks at the land. Designing surrounding spaces to give nature a hand. We open to the public two days a week. People learn food growing, starting from seed. Plant little seeds every day. Watching the world just change. Plant little seeds every day. Watching the world just change. Making cider and apples pressed. Of course organic food tastes the best. 2011, KMT Freedom Teacher is what they call me. The next question is asked, well, what does that mean? Freedom means choosing to do what I, you, we want to do. The teacher draws from within to guide you. Education and music, my marketing strategy. 12 years a social entrepreneur, the concept's not new to me. But check my account though, I need more dough. In nature, water and sun combine. So can we grow, can we grow, can we grow, can we grow? But to make real change starts from within. And then the abundance of wealth starts flooding in. Plant little seeds every day. Watching the world just change. Plant little seeds every day. Watching the world just change. 2012, May. I start at SSE. Ask me later what this means. Review my journey again, you'll see the synergy, especially if you study cosmology or numerology. 2014, the site self-sufficient in London, people will want to buy. With food growing, compost to reduce household bills, waste collecting rainwater to drink and nourish the crops, energy sourced and harness from the sun. The May Project Garden's legacy will live on and on and on. Plant little seeds every day. Watching the world just change. Plant little seeds every day. Watching the world just change. Uh, greetings, everyone. Thank you, first and foremost, for uh, being here. I'm going to start with my story. I'm going to split into three parts. Um, the first part is really the story of my mum and my childhood and when I grew up. So if you heard the, um, the, the track, Little Seeds, it was really talking about um, my journey looking after my mum. My mom. And out of that journey with my mum, becoming um, basically creating this project. The project's called May Project Gardens. And um, my mum basically um, suffered from a multitude of mental health issues, um, including being bipolar, depressive, dyslexia, alcoholic, anemia, like glitchy, like <laughs> what else can you throw into the mix? And as a young, young man, um, young, young boy actually having to care for her, um, was a really, really very challenging, horrific experience. Um, and, you know, just kind of like really having to deal with the day-to-day -day realities of actually caring for someone who had those issues as well. And feeling very powerless um, in those circumstances. Like, I, I kind of knew the answers. But one of the things I remember is that uh, my mum was sectioned at quite a few times within a mental institution, a psychiatric home. And um, I was like, I used to listen to the people in the, the, the inverted commas mental hospital. And I'd be like, I don't understand why they're here. Like I really used to listen to what they used to talk about. And I remember picking out a conversation in particular because obviously I was into music and I was into an artist called Tupac. 
And one of the guys in the hospital was like, you know, Tupac's not dead. He's not dead. He's not dead. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. This is after he passed away. But what he was actually talking about was the power of music to have an impact beyond their lifetime. So some artists, for example, kind of like become more famous after they pass away in the physical and become more popular in the spiritual. So it always made me think a lot about why do we, why do, why do we still treat human beings in this, in this day and age with all the information, with all the technology, with all the knowledge that we have in this way. And, you know, I, I've seen some horrific stuff happen to my mum. So for another example, um, she had EST. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. Um, if anyone's kind of of my age group, slightly older, then they might have um, seen um, a character called Frankenstein. And Frankenstein, basically, in order to bring the monster to life, they put electric um, electrodes on the, 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 the Frankenstein to come to life. Well, that was one of the treatments they used to have for, for, for people with mental health issues. They used to put electric, um, you know, um, uh, electric prongs on the person to actually bring them to life. So these kind of experiences were just horrific. They were very harrowing, just just very, they're just, you know, it's it's still difficult to this day to talk about this stuff, although it's, it's you know, it's it's a long time ago. And um, I suppose ultimately this shaped my outlook of how I saw society. It's a really, it, it's just, it's just to me, it's, it's barbaric that we still have this treatment of human beings to this day. And, you know, looking like I'm picking it more in a present day context, you know, I'm looking at the work of Maladoma Sosomi who looks at, talks about, mental health actually be a real opportunity for us to learn about how to be humans. So how do we care? We should measure our success and how we care for each other, not on the basis of, you know, how, you know, kind of we think we know how to treat someone with no experience as well. So that's kind of been the majority of my upbringing. My mum passed away in 2005 um, and she wasn't a very, um, yeah, it's it's you know I always start with this story because it's the most it's the most painful thing that's happened to me in my life, um, and the reason why I start with that is because this is the foundations and the the kind of um, the whole basis of the way um, I work. But I think I don't want to dwell on the hardship as much. I want to kind of bring it forward. But I give thanks for her life. And um, rays of light when she winds to the ground. So if anyone's seen anyone from the Caribbean, they have this dance or calypso music or soca music, and it, it, involves, a, it involves a lot of gyrating. My mum was a my mum was a was a was an expert gyrator. Do you know what I mean? So that's that memory that I have of her as well. Like you know when she's dancing as well. So rays of light when she's dancing is just like pure freedom. I love that as well. Then I also talk about um, it gave me compassion to the max. I think because of my experience of caring for somebody with mental health, I think I'm a really compassionate, compassionate individual. Not perfect. <laughs> I'm not saying that at all. Like, I'm not saying like that. Um, I'm not saying that at all. Like, you know, I think people who have definitely experienced trauma or experienced um, hardship, I say this thing, hurt people hurt people. So definitely that comes in, in this journey as well. So my mum passed away in 2005 and then um, a year later, uh, a gentleman moved into my home called Randy uh, Mayers um, and he basically moved in because he was studying at university in Kingston University. I'm on the, the edge of South London and so he wanted a place to stay and I was like, yeah, you're welcome. Um, so he moved in. Unbeknown to me that this person would literally just transform my 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 view of the world and um he was basically a permaculturist he was like a jedi of of nature like he just was just like i just couldn't believe the stuff he did and i'd be like hold on a minute like this guy's actually living in my house like 
So he'd be like, oh, can I work in your garden? And I'd be like, please do. Like, there's actually nothing really going on apart from me just kicking, like, grass or chopping, you know, kicking a ball in the grass. Like, so I was just like, I just, I was just absolutely amazed by um, this gentleman. Like, he literally was one in nature and he was slightly younger to me. And that was even more amazing. I was just a bit like, this is incredible. And at the same time, I was uh, kind of like, you know, in the grieving period of my mum, more relief um, than anything else because my mum had a really, you know, didn't have a great life. life. So I was more relieved of going through that stage. But I was also involved in the music industry. And um, the music industry, if anyone's been involved in it, it's a, it's a name. It's one of these beautiful forms. We have this beautiful form of music. But unfortunately, the stuff that gets celebrated the most tends to be the stuff that tends to be more negative or that tends to be more violent or tends to be celebrating, you know, the sexuality, the sexualization of women, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't really what I was about. So I had to deal with that stuff. And then um, then I also had to deal with the fact that I was working in a third sector, charitable sector. Um, that was my main job so between the music and the um, charitable sector. I was working in that environment. And I wasn't really getting my um, promotion. So because I was very empathetic, I'd do projects, I'd engage with communities, I'd make a really good impact. I'd be like, they were really engaging. They got really excited. We, you know, they'd be like fully on board. One example, we actually did this product with um, young people in the police and everyone was like, it would never work. You know, how are the young people going to work with the police, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, the young people weren't the issue. <laughs> the police were the issue because actually they just, they they had difficulty moving, like, you know, from their existing regime and systematic um, way of working in their organisation. The young people were like, you know what, I've had some issues with the police before, but I'm open to change. But then what happens is that you build this trust, you build up this rapport, and then unfortunately, um, and because of the funding, that work, that relationship stops. And I was like really trying to kind of, I was in my mind, I said, I knew I have to create an alternative. So that was a kind of background um, at the same time when Randy arrived. And then Randy just said, oh, can I get on with the garden? Can I, can I start growing? And that was the journey. This gentleman basically just turned my garden into like this amazing um, permaculture site. And I didn't really know much about permaculture at that time, but I knew the essence of how he was working. I, I saw the way he t observed and interacted. I saw the care. I saw the companion plot. And I saw all these things which actually were the ways I'd work, but in different sectors, in the music or in the charitable sector. But I didn't have a reference for that. I was just like, okay, this is how we work. So I was really fascinated to see him un kind of unravel um, this world of nature to me and at the same time see how I was already kind of doing this work but didn't have a reference for it as well so I was like wow so I was like Randy you know this permaculture thing like you know tell me more like you know as well as working in the garden with him growing food and you know just connecting putting my hands in the soil being outside like for example now you see I'm outside like this is my office um, I very much try to work as much as I can. I rehearse outside. I'm really much, I try to be as connected to nature, even in these fine, bright, bright autumn days. <laughs> um, I try to make a point of doing that. And I was like, tell me more. And then he started unpicking what permaculture. So if anyone knows, there's kind of three elements of permaculture, which is um, people care, earth care, and fair share. Now, he was very much an earth earth care. That was his thing. He was very much a person of the earth. And I was like, he just embodied that to the point where like we started kind of getting to a whole fair share debate about, you know, well, if you're not really paying rent, you know, this, that, and other, then you need to create your own space and this, that, and other. So fair enough, he did create his own tree house and he started living quite almost off grid on my site as well. And it was just a really amazing time. And I think what I brought in was the people care. So we kind of had these two really strong elements. Um, myself being into people care without me knowing it and then Randy being very strong on the earth care. And then the last one being the fair share. So um, as Obi said in the chat, um, the open house vibe is beautiful, community love. This is my home. Um, 
I didn't have a great resource. Um, I, I discovered later on that I'm dyslexic, so I couldn't apply for funding. So I didn't ever go for funding. So I was like, okay, well, I don't have the skill to actually apply for grants and go for funding, but I actually have a home. So I said to Randy, you know what? Can I can I invite people along? Can I can I? And he was like, yeah, of course. So started inviting my people from the, the artist world, people from the third sector, and it just grew from there. It just it just it just grew, literally just grew and grew and grew, and it was a magical journey. Um, we were one of the first organisations ever to work with young people using environments and music. Um, we've engaged people from all over the world, um, from Japan to China to India, to South Africa to Italy to Croatia. Like people have come to this space. We've just, I can't really express how wonderful this journey has been. Also very challenging as well. So I feel very blessed. Um, then Randy had to um, move out. He kind of felt that we kind of, we kind of shared a different kind of approach to um, where he wanted to go. He was very much wanted to live off grid and basically, you know, live more independently. He now lives in land matters as well. Uh, so anyone checks that out, do check him out. He's an incredible being. Um, but I was saying this is really good. But if we go back to the third element of permaculture, which is fair share, we know that actually we don't live in a fair share world. There is a, a growth in inequality um, in the world um, more than ever. You know, I really thought that COVID would be an opportunity for us to kind of reframe the way in which we redistribute our wealth and resources and stuff. But unfortunately, it hasn't happened. The flip side of that, there is people that are much more aligned, like the people in the room that want to make a difference. I was or, 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 or just inspired to make a difference as well. So I'm seeing that. So I was like, OK, well, you know, you want to live on this this space, but, you know, you, you know, you it's gonna it's gonna cost money we need to get we need to bring some sort of money in um and so i was like okay well i'm much more interested in how this work operates in an urban setting um because actually what we're seeing is for the first time in our history more people living in the urban environments than they're living in rural environments this is an unprecedented situation and how we don't have to even see where our waste comes from as well but we are the ones particularly in the western society that are creating the most as well so that's just a reference point there um so yeah so that was kind of the journey so i started to think to myself how on earth am i going to continue this journey after randy left and then i basically decided to kind of create these models that were really based on nature and so what I did, I turned my home into a community hub, which has been going for the last 16 years. It's called May Product Gardens, where anybody um, two to three days a week can come and learn about food growing, budding, green skills, architecture, anything to do with green, um, anything to reconnect people to nature. Um, that's what happens there. We have an award winning um, youth program called Hip Hop Garden which is used hip hop as a vehicle to basically promote the music, engage young people, but also to celebrate um, uh, creativity within uh, um, nature. We have an event called Come We Grow, where we basically have a platform where we actually, we just basically just try to platform, particularly people from um, non-white backgrounds, because we feel there's a real un underrepresentation of indigenous voices and marginalized voices in society. So, you know, we tried to do that through Come We Grow. Um, so for one example of that, we showed the film Coconut Revolution. If you ever get to see that film, it's amazing. Um, definitely worth checking out as well. That's one example. We've had um, we've had apple juice pressing on the dance floor. So basically you're pressing the apple juice, like the apple juice, like live, you know, live and direct. And then the cocktail waiter comes along, the cocktail waitress comes along and basically makes your cocktail with the apple juice and then you go off back on the dance floor. Like we do, we do that kind of stuff as well. So that's kind of come we grow. And then because I'm dyslexic, um, funding has always been a challenge. So this product was self-funded out of my own pocket for nine years. Um, just me working like ridiculous amount of hours, just kind of keeping it afloat as well. Um, and just trying to look at different ways to kind of make that happen as well. Um, and then, um, so that was happening for nine years. So like, you know, there was really no money coming in and it was like, but yeah, I managed to create all these kind of elements um, within the project 
um, on site using nature. And then the last one was basically using music to raise awareness. And because I'm dyslexic, I think music was a really good vehicle for me to kind of communicate my ed- ideas, but also to have some fun, you know, <laughs> to have some fun, but also to explore the social issues. And that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. The last part was that we tried, we formalized in 2000 after Randy left, I created all these models, but I needed support in terms of actually formalizing it because at the end of the day, um, how we work is very much on an experiential basis. It's very much, we try not to do too much of the, the theory. We really believe in this notion of having three brains, your head, your heart, and your gut, and really working from a place of the heart and the gut because the gut is the most sensitive part of um one of the most sensitive parts of our, our brains, one of the most intelligent brains that we have. So having food as a starting point, growing your food and eating together communally is one of the crucial things that we do a lot here as well. We're definitely a food foodie project as well, so that's crucial. Um, so we formalised, um, this is the last part, we formalised in about 2015 and, and brought on some people to kind of make sure that, you know, we could with the existing template, I call it an ecosystem now, so May Product Gardens ecosystem. The reason why I call it an ecosystem is because that really gives you a real sense of what a community is like. And the reason why I say um, that, or a grassroots community, is because it relies on codependence. When you have a lot of wealth, affluence, networks and stuff, you don't have to. You can do things without having much accountability, including nature. Um, so you can go off and do what you want to do. And no one's really going to say to you, oh, you shouldn't do it like this. But when you work in a grassroots um, community, you're always dependent on someone else to make things happen. And so that's why I call it an ecosystem, because the earth works in that similar sort of way. And I think that's a really invaluable way of looking at the work we do. So many people are saying, you've been going for 16 years. How come we never heard of you? It's because actually we've been working in this kind of way as, uh, as well. So we formalized. Um, and, you know, we started to grow, become really successful. And, you know, nice couple of awards here. See, nice couple of awards, all that kind of good stuff as well. Got quite a few of those on the journey as well. Um, and it was really magical. And we started to get to be a real pioneer, particularly in terms of how to engage diverse communities. We're not specific to one demographic. So just, just you know, make sure that's clear. Um, we just recognized that there was a lot of people like single mums that weren't getting no support. So one of the things we made a very, we were very intentional in terms of when we started to formalize is employing single mums. And the reason why we did that is because actually the way in which the labor market works in terms of childcare, if you're a single mum that um, has a child, the cost to actually have childcare often outweighs your the wages you're going to get. So we were like, okay, well, if that's an issue, like let's try to make a point of actually really employing single mums here and they can even bring their children here. So that's been a big um, emphasis. Despite being um, a man, um, you know, um, I was grew, I grew up with an all-female household. So that was another big emphasis of my work to ensure that actually, again, in terms of um, this notion of margins and edges, which I'll get into a little bit more with, into from a permaculture perspective, um, still to this day, despite all the advances in technology and all the stuff we know again, blah, 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 women still don't get paid the same rate as men in this society to this day. So I was very conscientious of that, knowing my experience of my mum, like knowing how, you know, how brutalised she was. And I was like, okay, so let's try and address that through the work as well. So my team was very much 70% women and, you know, that's kind of how it worked. We made a big point about that. Unfortunately, um, someone within my team who was, I won't name her name, um, but she basically um, was, in a, in a nutshell, trying to take over the project. So um, last year, um, despite the success we were growing, doing really well, when COVID hit, we were one of the few projects that actually grew within COVID because of the work we do did. Um, there was a legislation, there was a, a government legislation saying that if you have a green space you, and your education site, you could work with up to 12 people. So we maximized it. Like we really just like, literally, we we didn't really stop in COVID. We were kind of like, you know, we were actually working through the whole of COVID. And actually, if I give you a quick flip, 
in the background, you can see this is a straw bell classroom. And if you go to uh, my website or the Instagram, um, you will see basically there's some kind of um, photos of us doing that. And we built that within COVID because what we recognise is that I needed more space to separate the growth of the project and my personal space as well. It's very enmeshed in terms of the project, you know. So basically, um, this person was trying to take over the project. I was very aware of, of it happening, but I couldn't really explain to the rest of the team because they people do think I'm a little bit, let's put it politely, crazy. And I think you kind of have to be um, to do what, what I do. Um, so I kind of got it, but it was really frustrating because I'm not, because I'm dyslexic, which I discovered much later on, I only discovered about five, six years ago. Most people communicate in this world through the written, um, you know, the word. So basically, if you're in a position, generally speaking, if you're in a position of power, most, if you get a contract, you have to read the contract, you have to write a contract. That I can't do that. I struggle with reading, reading and writing. So every step of my every step of my of my journey has been a real challenge for me to kind of be understood in terms of my vision. So I was like, you know what? Let me demonstrate. That's how I've always worked. I've said, let's demonstrate what I want to do. Let me show you. And that's kind of how it worked as well. But sometimes being able to demonstrate versus someone who can write a, a, a remarkable 20 page thesis and paper kind of gets eclipsed as well. So that's kind of what happened there. So that happened. So I had to basically, I, I had to make a decision about where I wanted to go with this project. Do I continue it with this sense of um, my basically being exploited and being taken over as a project or do I shut it down? Now, I always use nature as the reference point as my guide. Like That's why I sit in the garden because I watch the animals. I've got this cat that's amazing at the moment. I'm watching, observing. I'm like watching its pathways and where it's living and where it's walking about. And I just enjoy watching nature. And I watched this documentary. I don't know if anyone's seen this documentary about um, the octopus on Netflix. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah? Okay. So that helped me make a decision about what I'm going to do with my project. Now, I was faced with, you know, after 15 years of doing this great work, um, do I continue to run myself to the ground or start again? And after watching that octopus video, I said to myself, you know what? If the octopus can die to give life to, to, to its young, right, my octopus teacher, brilliant. Um, I can start this project all over again. So I said to her, you know what? Take what you want. Take all the money you want. Take all the staff you want. Go and do your own thing. Do you know what I mean? And just said to her, just just get on with it. It was a really painful experience. Like it was, it's, I've just recovering it from, from now. We just started. It happened last year, August, in the middle of COVID. But I said to myself, you know what? I can start again. And that's exactly where I'm doing at the moment as well with my new team, with my new people as well. And to continue this work in a very much a heart-centric way as well. So, um, Believe me, at the time I was I was literally going crazy. I was like, I knew that, um, you know, I knew that I was being taken over. I knew I was being exploited. I knew I wasn't being valued within my own organization that I created. But this theme is not so uncommon in grassroots organizations because of the nature of the lack of resources and the vulnerability they have. It's a very common theme. And then off the back of that, I had an amazing, uh, I managed to get um, an amazing job working for Bristol City Council as the climate change engagement and diversity manager. So off the back of that, I was like, well, that gives me a bit of security, gives me time to kind of just restructure the project. And here we are, literally about a year later, reopening the project and starting again as well. So that's my story. A huge thanks to Ian, aka KMT for sharing his story and passion with us all. If you'd like to connect with KMT, listen to his music, or find out more about May Project Gardens, check out the links in the show notes. And if you're enjoying the We As Nature podcast, one of the best ways you can support our work is to share it with others and leave us a review. The We As Nature podcast is recorded live during an online gathering, where each month a new guest shares their story and attendees enjoy the opportunity to connect with other listeners. You can find a link to our upcoming We As Nature live events, which are free to attend, in the show notes. 
We as Nature is brought to you by Flourishing Diversity, an initiative bringing together voices from all over the world to explore humanity's interconnection with the lands, waters, forests and fellow species. Flourishing Diversity is a path towards a vibrant future and offers a collective approach in response to climate breakdown and biodiversity loss. We create spaces to listen to and learn from all life, raise critical questions, search for alternative answers, and amplify generative biocultural practices. You can register to receive updates and inspiration from us at flourishingdiversity.com, as well as finding us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. All the links are in the show notes. Thanks for being here, and we hope you'll join us again soon.